Good afternoon. Happy Wednesday, everyone. Allison Scobber, Consolidated Planning Group. Uh, we are here today with Ginger Mayo uh, from the Arc of Texas. We're excited uh, to have her back with us today. Uh, we are talking about the ever important uh, topic of waivers, the confusion behind waivers, the waiting list, everything you need to know about that. Um, Ginger has been um, a speaker for us in the past. She does a great job. She's very, very knowledgeable about what she's um, what she does. She's been very, very involved uh, in this uh, current legislative session uh, in Austin, which I'm told is uh, there's 11 days uh, left in that. So um, when it comes to special needs planning, there's so many factors that we need to keep uh, keep in mind. And um, so we're here. Consolidated Planning Group is a special needs financial planning firm. And, um, and we just put out regular uh, webinars to educate you and help make your journey a little bit easier um, as you're planning uh, for yourself, for your own retirement, and for your loved one with special needs. So having said that, um, today uh, this uh, presentation is being recorded. Your, um, your mics and your cameras are muted, so we can't see you or we can't hear you. Um, but uh, your questions and your voice does matter, so um, we do want to hear your questions. Please put your questions in the chat box. Um, I'm going to be monitoring the chat box today, and we're going to get uh, through just as many questions as we possibly can. And this uh, webinar is scheduled from 12 to 1, so if you're planning for lunch or a break from uh, schooling your kids or whatever you got going on, uh, that is the plan. And uh, today it is being recorded. So either later today or tomorrow, uh, you will get an email uh, with the recording and Ginger's contact information, all of our contact information as well. So um, having said that, Ginger, I'm going to turn it right on over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Allison. <clears throat> and good afternoon, everyone. I am happy to be here. Um, as Allison said, I'm Ginger Mayo. I'm the Director of Public Policy and Advocacy for the ARC of Texas. So also, as Allison said, um, we've been working very hard for the past 131 days. I, I, my math is off on that. I think it's 129 days. And we just have 11 left. And hopefully by the end of the week, we'll have good news on waiver services and maybe additional funding for Texans with uh, disabilities. And with that, I will go ahead and kick it off. Um, so uh, here's the obligatory, who is the ARC of Texas that Ginger works for slide. And um, we are a statewide advocacy organization that promotes, protects, and advocates for the human rights and self-determination of Texans with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Go to the next one. So as a statewide advocacy organization, um, we do things like this where I present on certain topics as well as um, other folks on my team present on different topics. But largely what we do is work with um, legislators and state agencies to create and implement policies that positively impact people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in Texas. And the most important thing we do in this, which is why even though this presentation is not about advocacy, I have to put a plug in for this, is we try to empower and educate people like you to speak up for yourself and to share your stories because you're the ones most impacted by policies and decisions made. So we need your voice when making those decisions. So we will start out in that empowering and educating um, role by talking today about the who, what, when, where, why, how, and all those fun things of, uh, involving waivers. As you can see, there is a whole lot we could cover. And I think I have 33 slides, but we, these will be mostly informational. There is no way I could cover 33 slides in detail in an hour and answer all the individual questions people have. So you'll get all of these slides. They'll be um, mostly, a lot of them will be informational and then just don't hesitate to reach out and get more info on anything. So we're gonna start out with just the basics of what is Medicaid. <clears throat> and you can just go on to the next one. 
And that might sound a little odd, um, but I found over the years that a lot of people don't understand the basics of Medicaid. You might even be receiving Medicaid or your loved one receives Medicaid, but you understand like the, in the weeds pieces of it, you've never gotten the foundational piece of Medicaid. And that foundation is gonna be important to understanding waivers and all these other things I'm gonna talk about. So the first thing to understand about Medicaid is it is a state and federal partnership. So even though we get a lot of federal funds and we have to follow certain federal rules to receive Medicaid, ultimately states develop how they implement Medicaid, who receives it, what they offer. And so Medicaid does not not transfer state to state. I get calls from people all the time saying, I'm moving to Texas, how do I get services? Or I'm moving out of Texas, do my, can I take my HCS with me? The answer is no. Um, Medicaid does not transfer state to state. And the other important thing to understand is Medicaid typically covers two types of services. We've got our acute care, which is our medical care, which is what people without disabilities typically think of as what they get through their private insurance. It's those doctor's visits, emergency room, anything short term. Then we have long-term services and supports. And this is what we're gonna focus a lot on today because it is something that really only Medicaid covers. And that's, that's really an important talking point for you guys to understand and to be telling decision makers like, hey, did you know private insurance doesn't cover long-term services and supports, which are those things like you can see on the screen, an attendant to help you get in and out of bed or um, help you bathe, whatever you need um, based on a disability, employment services, all of those things that people with disabilities depend on to live independently in their communities not covered by private insurance. Um, Ginger, I recently heard on another presentation that there is 109 Medicaid like programs, like under the Medicaid umbrella, 109 programs in the state of Texas, depending on what the individual's needs might be. Um, how does a person uh, go about learning about what programs might be, um, that they might be eligible for? Do you have any information on that? I do. I actually, um, so the 109, I'm sure, stands way more than disability because Medicaid also um, covers uh, low-income kiddos and pregnant women. Um, I believe if you go to My Texas Benefits and you fill out the form, my understanding is it will tell you everything you are eligible for. And um, in my expertise, uh, being intellectual and developmental disability, uh, I'm going to always refer people to their local intellectual and developmental disability authority, which there'll be a link to at the end, um, towards the end of the presentation. So okay. for those, for IDD, I would go to your local authority, but you can fill out the My Texas Benefits form and believe it'll tell you everything you're eligible for. What, uh, when once you said that you're exactly right um i remember going through that um with one of my kids and it does pop up the programs that you might be eligible and once you go through it i mean it's a little bit of work you have to do to get there but um but it actually does do that that's a that's a good point every now and then we streamline stuff all right in texas yay so digging in a little bit more to this, what is Medicaid and understanding, again, that foundation of Medicaid. We've got two types of things we're gonna talk about today, um, largely the waivers, obviously, but we have entitlements and waivers. And if you're unfamiliar with entitlements, the easiest way to um, think about entitlements is uh, public school, public education, <clears throat> all kids, in the United States are entitled to a public education. So that's an entitlement. In Texas, um, so if you are legally, uh, if you are eligible, you have a legal right to it, they have to provide it. Um, the easiest way to understand it, like you can see in this slide, is it by comparing entitlements to waivers. So entitlements, 
you get if you are eligible. States are not allowed to have wait lists for them. Just like they can't say, Allison, I know you want to go to school, but you're going to have to wait until we have an opening. On the flip side, we have Medicaid waivers. Waivers were designed to be an alternative to institutions because the majority of Medicaid entitlements that provide long-term services and supports, so I know I'm throwing out a lot of things, but I think it'll all kind of come together in the end. Remember, I just talked about those long-term services and supports. Those entitlements are almost always provided in an institutional setting. If you want to be in the community and have those long-term services and supports, typically your only option is a Medicaid waiver. Waivers are not entitlements, which means states determine how many waivers they will provide and how often and who's eligible. They waive off of institutional settings or they waive certain Medicaid rules to allow certain things. But it is waivers are 100% dependent on the legislature in Texas every two years deciding how much to fund and if any new people will receive those services. Entitlements you can get without a waiver. So in theory, so th this is sometimes confusing, the wave off of some institutional settings. Um, could you talk about the premise behind that? Like, so is in theory, a person with disabilities is better off in their community. So if they can provide supports for them to stay in the community, I, tell us what that means. So in a nutshell, if you look at like the history of Medicaid and the disability movement, way back the only people didn't understand disability particularly intellectual and developmental disability and so we created these institutions to put people with disabilities away um, and take care of them in an institutional setting like a nursing facility or in texas we call um our state supported living centers are essentially institutions for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities so those were designed to be government funded places to protect people with um, disabilities <clears throat> and meet their needs. Over time, we learned people with disabilities could live in the community and wanted to live in the community, but we didn't have a Medicaid option for that. All we had were these institutions. So as that movement evolved, we started creating things such as uh, called Medicaid waivers to allow um, those same services you see in an institution to be provided in the community as an alternative to institutions. And sometimes even in your own home, I'm not just in the community, but sometimes um, many times even in your own home. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and you'll hear more about that throughout the presentation. Hopefully that was clear. Again, sometimes it's like the, the presentation starts out where you're like, this is clear as mud. And then the goal is for it to kind of all start to come together. And um, so over the years, as we moved away from um, institutions being the only option, we've developed the waivers you see here. I think it's a seven. Um, Medicaid, home and community-based Medicaid waivers in the state of Texas. Let me go to the next slide. So this is where it kind of will start to pull things together of the wave off of and stuff like um, Alice and I were just talking about. I wish I could almost just have this behind me with slides because I think it, it's how my brain functions as a visual person. So when you get these slides, you can just use this as a quick reference of all the other pieces I just talked about. But um, if you look over here in the, um, the square on the top left where you've got Medicaid, like we talked about in the beginning. So you've got Medicaid, and then you've got the two types of types of Medicaid offered the LTSS or long-term services and supports, which is the thing that private insurance doesn't cover. And then you've got the acute care in the other gray box on the right. 
Acute care is just a fancy word for medical care, essentially. In Texas, we've got two types of acute care programs. STAR Plus, which a lot of you have probably heard of, which is for adults with disabilities, and then STAR Kids, which is for kids with disabilities. Now, when you go over to the kind of teal box of uh, long-term services and supports, under that, we've got two types of institutional settings, like I just talked about. You've got your nursing facility in the orange, and then you've got your ICF, which is intermediate care facility, and state-supported living centers. This gets a little weird. State-supported living centers are intermediate care facilities. They are our publicly uh, run ICFs. And then we also have private ICFs. When I say waivers wave off of an institution, the same, so if you are eligible for a nursing facility, you are also eligible for one of the three options you see under nursing facility orange box, the STAR Plus waiver, medically dependent children's program or MDCP, and community first choice. If you are eligible for an intermediate care facility, that green box, you would also be eligible for one of the waivers listed below, class, HCS, DBMD, Texas Home Living, and Community First Choice. I know I did not just say all the names of those, but they were on the previous slide. And you will rarely hear people call waivers anything but by the acronym. A little more detail on this slide than you probably even need, but the orange box, the community first choice is under both nursing facility and ICF, as you'll see. That's because that is one of the only entitlements in Texas that provides long-term services and it waves off of any institutional setting. Um, CFC is not a waiver, it's an entitlement. It is um, attendant services and habilitation. So a lot of, for a lot of people, it might not be enough to support all of your needs in the community, but it is definitely better than nothing. And last thing on this slide, um, I won't have time today to dig into what is managed care, but if you see a red box around anything on this slide, it means it is, um, it is run by a managed care organization, not fee for service through the state. Um, I'm putting some of the acronyms in here so people have them um, handy. Can you um, tell us again the SSLC and what that is um, that stands for? I think I captured the others. Uh, State Supported Living Center. Okay. And that is a um, the state run intermediate care facility or institution for people with IDT. And unfortunately, we have 13 in the state of Texas. What about the MDCP? I know it's medically dependent. I just got that. Okay. It's the got medically it. dependent children's program. And so kiddos who are eligible for a nurse, they call it nursing facility level of care. So if your support needs are to um, the extent that you could be admitted to a nursing facility, this, the same criteria would make you eligible for the medically dependent children program. I mean, that's, that's a very loose statement. Everything with Medicaid and disability is always like 50 caveats. There's always a, if this, then this, and if that, then that. But for sure. Speaking. But there is, isn't there some like definitive things with MDCP, like a trach or a feeding tube or a ventilator or some other things like that, that is kind of a slam dunk as it relates to um, MDCP? Or there's no slam dunks. It's Medicaid. <laughs> it's like... Yeah, I, I hear that a lot. And I, I don't actually know that there's, a, I don't know that that's a listed criteria or it's just the, an easy way to think of it. Um, so I'm, I'm not 100% on that, and I hesitate sure. because um, people's needs are people's needs, and I don't like it when the state says, well, 
if you had a ventilator, we'd give you this service, but since you don't, you don't get it. Um, I'd rather people look at what is this individual actual needs and let's provide that. Right. So in general, speaking of eligibility and, and different things, um, generally speaking, all of the waivers are for all ages, except MDCP, like we were just talking about, that's for kiddos. And then star plus waiver is for adults. Um, it is a little confusing because we've got the star plus medical care and then the star plus waiver, um, which are separate, but basically the two waivers that waive off of in, uh, nursing facility level of care are also the two waivers that um, are age specific. Financial eligibility is the same for all the waivers except Texas Home Living. And the good thing for a lot of kiddos is except for Texas Home Living, eligibility is based solely on the child's income, not the parental. And so almost all kids would be eligible because they don't have an income. And we are working to get Texas Home Living to have the same eligibility um, criteria as the other waivers, but at this time, uh, they do look at parental income. Uh, it's also the only waiver that you have to be um, eligible for SSI, or your income has to be within SSI range or lower. The other waivers are at 300% of SSI, which is what you see is at 2,313. This is um, one of your there are many important slides, but this is one of my favorite ones and one of the things that come um, comes up over and over again. So I want to get some clarity um, on this. So we're talking, you know, like when we're thinking about SSI, the magic number of 2000 and assets. OK, you know, to anything over 2000, basically, you might, you know, as a single person, you don't qualify for SSI. When you're talking about this 300 percent of SSI 2313, is this assets or is this income? Are you speaking of assets? It's income. So this is this is income because one of the questions that we get on a pretty regular basis is um, for people that have come up on the waiver list. So they're getting the waiver. You know, they're not still in the holding period, right? They're getting the waiver. Mom or dad, um, they're a disabled adult child um, through the Social Security Administration. Mom or dad are getting ready to retire. And the, the disabled adult child is going to switch over from SSI to Social Security. And there's this, this delicate balance of how do I not lose my waiver? Like, I, 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 can, can you talk about that? Because this is something that comes up almost every week. Can you, can you talk a little bit further about this number and, and what that means for that? I can, I can talk a little bit about it. Um, I am not. Um an eligibility or financial expert in any way. Um, I do, we do have someone on our staff who deals with this all the time. Um, Haley Greer works on this uh, issue regularly. Again, there's a lot of caveats. So like disabled adult child, you might be eligible for DAC, which is disabled adult child. There's different things that um, can allow you to still qualify and being eligible for Medicaid because you're eligible for the waiver is different than being eligible for SSI, generally speaking. And so sometimes people get kicked off of their waiver due to um, a flaw, honestly, in the state system. It like codes it as they're no longer eligible for this when it really should have flipped them from eligible because of this to eligible because of the waiver. So um, when that kind of stuff happens, we can usually intervene to some extent and help people figure it out. But there's a flaw in our system at HHSC that will kick people off when they shouldn't have been. And it's a matter of kind of recoding it. And then there's all kinds of other, the pickle amendment and things that I'm not as familiar with, but I know each individual situation could um, impact this differently. 
I think that the key takeaway, you know, um, if you're if you're getting the waiver, you're thinking about retiring, turning on Social Security, um, or you're becoming disabled, um, it can have an impact on your disabled adult child. And there's a lot of moving parts. They're not the individual is working, whether they're getting SSI, so SSI qualifications, Medicaid qualifications, waiver qualifications. Um, they're not all the same. And so anyway, uh, if, if you're taking notes, the important thing is, is, um, is going to be important to get in the weeds and um, we can, we can help you with these types of things. Everybody's situation is a little bit different because everybody's social security <laughs> is different. So, um, but, I, but it's just an important conversation that with maybe a little bit of thought and working with some of these um, other agencies, um, you know, that hopefully you won't get you know, kicked off. It doesn't mean that you won't, but hopefully a lot of times um, people get kicked, are getting kicked off, not because of a glitch in the system. It's because they didn't know what they didn't know. And they actually were getting kicked off because they were supposed to get kicked off because they didn't hit one of those criteria, one of the many criteria. So anyway, I just wanted to chat about that for a second. Now, and it's important, especially considering what um, the consolidated planning group does and, and others it's always better to think it through ahead of time and put the right safeguards in place than try and fix it. Even if it wasn't your fault and it's a state system flaw, it's still not gonna be easy um, to, to get things kicked back in and it's still gonna be a burden. So the, it's wheels, the wheels of fixing a state or a federal um, error uh, turn very slowly, much slower than as a parent what you want them to turn. So that we just try to, um, we try to prevent that on the front end. Absolutely. Um, and then uh, you don't have to go back to the other slide, but I did wanna say there's all the financial stuff we just talked about, but then you also have to meet functional eligibility for the each individual waiver, which, really goes back to what we talked about in that um, high level overview with all the colorful boxes of functional eligibility for a nursing facility or functional eligibility for an intermediate care facility. There's kind of different requirements. Um, and each waiver has a little bit uh, different nuance, but you will see that um, as I get into each specific waiver. All of the waivers provide some of the basic long-term services and supports um, that you see here. Um, remember, MDCP is the only waiver for kiddos only, and children's Medicaid is super comprehensive. And so basic acute care Medicaid covers a lot of the stuff for kids that you only get through the long-term services or waiver as an adult. So that's why this is different in the black and blue. Next slide. There's just some other waiver services that are in some programs, but not all that you might be familiar with. Next slide. And so now I'm going to give you guys just kind of high level overview picture of um, some of the waivers uh, or all of the waivers offered in Texas, um, except for I'm not going to touch on the yes waiver and people <clears throat> are always super interested in the yes waiver and they totally get it. It's just um, the yes waiver does support some people with intellectual and developmental disabilities for sure, but it is designed to be prime um, for people who have a primary diagnosis of mental illness. And that's a little bit out of the arc of Texas's wheelhouse. So um, I'm going to focus largely on the um, IDD specific waivers. Ginger, um, I, I would like to comment on the YES waiver just really quick, and I'll, um, then I'll let Me you too. kind of take that away. Um, the YES waiver is a fabulous waiver, and in general, uh, in speaking, uh, you know, if you're if your kid is um, below 18 and they have kind of any any of these things, okay, basically any of, any of the mental health um, initials, ADHD, ODD, DMDD, bipolar, BPD, any uh, depression, anxiety, basically anything that you can think of when it comes to that. If and, and it's not plus this, if they've been a runaway, if they've been in trouble in school, if they've been arrested, um, if they have anger issues, um, like, you know, the, you know, there's just so many different things, um, maybe any addiction issues, drugs or anything like that. It's not all, it's any one of those 
uh, they may be a good candidate for the yes waiver. And the reason I wanted to mention this is the yes waiver is basically, well, I don't know about the community first choice, but it's basically the only waiver in Texas that most people don't know about, and there's not a waiting list for this. So it's a wraparound program. It's really going to help. Um, um, it, what they're trying to do is like these difficult situations what you're, with, um, that you may be having um, with your, your child with these, these issues is they're trying to do this wraparound program for the child. It's custom designed and tailored to the child to prevent the child being institutionalized or um, you know, parents walking away and throwing their hands up in the air because sometimes that happens in those teenage years. So it's a good program. You can contact your local authority and um, sign up for it. And like I said, this one is one that um, so far there hasn't been a waiting list on. So anyway, having said that, check out the yes waiver. I'm gonna turn it back over to you for HCS. Right, I think it is important to, to note that with the reason the yes waiver doesn't have a wait list is because the eligibility is a little bit stricter and it's a temporary waiver. It does those wraparound services and tries to get people stabilized and then it expires where some of all the waivers I'm gonna talk about today are um, except MDCP because you become an adult um, are not short term. And so th that's one of the differences with the yes waiver. It's not going to meet the um, needs of the individual with an intellectual and developmental disability forever. It's, it's a more of a crisis stabilization type situation. So that I think is one of the reasons it does not have a weight. Uh, it is a fantastic program though, and for some people it's also how they then qualify for Medicaid in general and get a whole bunch of services that are needed just through basic Medicaid for kiddos. So on to um, HCS, the Home and Community-Based Services Waiver. I like to talk about each waiver by telling some um, stories of people who use them and why. So uh, this is my friend, Charlie. Um, as you can see, Charlie lived in an institution for a good portion of his life. And then he finally got an HCS waiver and moved into um, the community after 35 years of being in an institution. Um, what the, the types of services and supports Charlie needs are essentially someone to make sure that um, he gets his food and the right types of tasks. He needs occasional help with shaving and things because of his cerebral palsy, but he doesn't need the level of um, support that someone who maybe lives in a group home needs. So he chooses to live in a host home with um, a friend who helps support his needs in the community um, where they're essentially like roommates, but his roommate or host home provider provides those uh, additional supports he might need. And you can go to the next slide. Allison, you're on mute. Thanks. Um, um, in the example of this HCS waivers and he's like in this host um, home, um, you know, how can you talk about like how, so he's getting this HCS waiver um, how, how does SSI figure into that? Do you have any um, insight on that? Yeah, so, and it'll kind of connect to um, talking about um, group homes. So there, I'll reframe how I'm talking about HCS for this purpose. Um, so a lot of people are interested in the home and community-based services or HCS waiver because it provides what we call residential. Residential services does not mean it provides housing per se. Medicaid does not pay for housing or room and board. Medicaid pays for the services and support someone needs to live um, productively and have a quality of life. So, <clears throat> Medicaid doesn't pay for housing. When we talk about residential, what we mean is either someone who comes into your own home or your family home to um, help support you. Typically, the easiest way to think of it would be like an attendant, 
or you can live in a, an HCS group home, which is three to four people who live um, who live together, and then there's staff that come in and out. Host home, and I will get to funding. Don't worry, Allison. Host home is more of a roommate type situation, but where the person who owns the home and agrees to provide the services and supports the person with a disability needs gets paid to provide those services. None of that, none of the room and board aspect is paid for by Medicaid or the Medicaid waiver. So if you were in a host home or group home, just like if you were in your own home, you're responsible for paying rent, and money, whether it's all lumped in together or not, for room and board. That money typically for people with IDD comes from their social security check. Um, if you work and therefore don't receive social security, then you will pay the same amount out of your paycheck instead of your social security check. But Medicaid does not pay for room and board. That's separate. And I, and I think one of the things is, is really SSI is designed to pay for room and board. And so that's kind of that whole other, the whole other category. That's the whole point of SSI, even though it's not necessarily enough to pay for room and board, that the theory behind it is for room and board. Exactly. And it should go hand in hand with the services and support you need to live successfully in your home. And then SSI supplements for that room. Um, and I do see there's a question of um, who pays for clothing and, and whatnot in a group home. Again, the individual, um, their SSI check or their employment check or a combination of both is what would pay for clothing as well. Um, but you might have an individual who needs support from uh, their provider to go to the store and pick out the right size clothes or the clothes for the, the appropriate weather, that type of support is provided through the HCS waiver. The money to actually purchase the clothing is not provided through the waiver. One, one thing, yeah, one thing that you, um, I, I don't think you mentioned yet, um, but I think that is important as far as getting on some of these waiting lists that it, you don't you don't necessarily prove eligibility when you get on the list. You prove eligibility when you come up on the list for services. Is that correct? So, so basically, all of these waivers, most of most of them can, and maybe you can tell us which ones don't. Um, they're looking at that IDD diagnosis. Um, that's part part of it. Um, can you talk about that? Yes, so HCS, again, caveats, 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 right? Um, HCS, <clears throat> in order to qualify for HCS, and you know what, um, I need to just start sending this to you right away, Allison, is that chart that'll list things. To qualify for HCS, you either need to have an IQ of um, 70 or below, as well as some different functional support needs. Um, they call activities with daily living, essentially. You could also have an IQ of 75 or below and what we call a related condition, which could be something like cerebral palsy, autism, um, or you could have a developmental disability, um, not an intellectual disability, but be eligible for a nursing facility in which case we have a process to prevent you from ending up having to, from ending up in a nursing facility, you could get the HCS waiver. So that's the only time you, you don't have to have an intellectual disability and get the HCS waiver is if you are also eligible for a nursing facility. I just want to say here to any families that have kids with disabilities that are not in that IDD category, it does not mean that you should you should um, not be on the list because the eligibility is at the time that they come up on the list. And 
while you may have your child might be 80, they might be 90, they, they may be above, there are things that happen along the way that can change things. Um, so what you see may not be the future. You, you just don't know. So you want to give yourself those options and um, opportunities in the future by keeping them on the list and that eligibility will be determined later. Yep. Agreed. Um, and, and people's people's needs change. And I, I know I said I was going to talk largely about the IDD waivers. You will hear that the STAR Plus waiver, um, you don't have to have an intellectual disability or a developmental disability. Um, the class waiver, uh, again, speaking of eligibility, so the class waiver, uh, you don't have to have an intellectual disability. You do have to have a developmental disability. Again, I will send you guys a link to like a cheat sheet that will list some of this. And some of it's pretty wonky, like it's very in the weeds, but it'll also clarify who's eligible for what and how. We're gonna add that cheat sheet to the email today with this recording. So everybody will have what she's referring to. We're gonna put that out there. Great, thank you. Every time I present with you guys, I end up saying that after. I don't know why I can't remember it. We're an inquisitive bunch, we have questions. <laughs> so, um, just briefly, I, I want to be mindful of the time. One of the unique services uh, to the class waiver that people oftentimes, um, the reason they like the class waiver or the class waiver meets their child's needs is class ha offers what they call specialized therapies. HCS has those, those residential services some people need. Class has these specialized therapies which might be massage therapy, um, equine therapy, different things like that. It's important to note, if you're not familiar, massage therapy doesn't mean just when getting a massage at a spa. Massage therapy for some people with disabilities can prevent them from needing to take certain types of medication, can um, alleviate constipation, and all kinds of other um, situation. So massage is actually a very important therapy for people with disabilities. In addition, uh, class has recreational therapy, which I have to mention here because this photo um, on the left with um, it was my friend Skye, who has the scarves all around her. So Skye's recreational therapist figured out that Skye is deafblind and has cerebral palsy. But her rep therapist was able to figure out that just because she was deaf and blind, she could learn to knit because it's tactile. She doesn't have to see it or hear it. She can feel it. And so Skye has learned to knit and runs her own business where she sells those scarves. And that was something that recreational therapy through the class waiver provided her. Yes. The Deaf, Blind, Multiple Disability Waiver, eligibility, again, I'll, I'll mention, this one's pretty obvious. You do have to be deaf, blind, and have a third disability. It's a very small subset of the population um, that qualify for this. It's also a fairly small um, wait list compared to the others for obvious reasons. One of the cool things about the Deaf, Blind, Multiple Disability Waiver is it offers something called intervener services. And again, all of these services I'm listing as unique to each waiver shows how we've designed these programs to meet the individual unique needs of each person. Um, so interveners are basically um, like Ann Sullivan to Helen Keller, the person who helps someone who's deaf, blind, experience, see, feel the world. So it's tactile. It might be um, touching in your hand so you can understand what's going on. And that service is unique to this waiver. Texas Home Living, we talked about how the eligibility criteria and whatnot is a little bit different with Texas Home Living. Um, the, the interesting thing, uh, or the, the good thing about this waiver is a lot of people say it's a, a lower support waiver it is very similar to hcs minus the residential components and so 
some people who may not need as high level or as min, as much, um, they, they don't need as uh, the comprehensive services provided through some of the other waivers could benefit from Texas Home Living, even if it's while waiting for a more comprehensive waiver. Uh, a lot of times people's name will come up on the Texas Home Living um, waiver list before some of the others. And even if it doesn't have all the services that meet your needs, you can go ahead and take Texas Home Living, get some services while waiting for HCS or class. Um, we have a question on the Texas Home Living. Um, and if, if you need to defer, certainly just let us know. Um, I have Texas Home Living because of an IDD diagnosis. Medicaid was denied based on income, not on the waiver program um, that he is listed. How can we address this issue? We might want to talk offline for me to understand a little bit more on if you were denied Texas Home Living because of income or if you have Texas Home Living. Um, and we'll put your contact information in the email and then um, and then then they can just reach out directly on um, to, uh, to you on that matter. So thank you for that. Yeah, that would be great. Cause, and, and, and it may be that unfortunately the Texas Home Living income eligibility is different than all the other waivers. And so sometimes people don't qualify. Again, we are working on that, but with 11 days next in session, left in session, no promises. We do have a bill about it. Um, medically dependent children's program, um, like I said, oh, uh, it, provides, um, it provides some specific services uh, that people benefit from largely it helps people qualify for Medicaid in general, but it um, uh, a lot of parents benefit from respite and then nursing. So it's for a lot of kids who are um, more medically fragile. And then the picture that was up there, which we'll beat to it in just in time. Um, both of these kiddos um, have MDCP now. But when I met um, uh, Diana and Amelia, who were on the left side, um, Amelia is deaf, um, uses a G2, and has uh, seizures to where she would wake up in the middle of the night and sometimes have a seizure or stop breathing. And her mom, because they, uh, of their income, they didn't qualify for Medicaid. Without Medicaid, they couldn't get that in-home nursing and those long-term services and supports that only Medicaid covers. So Diana was sleeping every night next to Amelia with her hand on her chest so she could feel if Amelia stopped breathing or had a seizure and she could take care of her. They finally came up on the Medically Dependent Children's Program wait list. And with that, we're able to qualify for Medicaid in general because again, they waive parental and they don't look at parental income. So of course, Amelia qualifies because she doesn't have income. And with that, with getting Medicaid, they now have nurses that are there at night and other types of equipment and services so that mom can um, sleep and be a mom and not constantly being um, the medical provider and protector. So any example that a person um, had an um, MDCP waiver, but they no longer have a trach and no longer um, get nursing hours, can the child still qualify for Medicaid through traditional Medicaid, or is it going to be based off of the parents, um, the, the parents' resources until the child turns 18? If you're not getting it through the waiver, it's going to have the income restrictions of the parents. But if you were, if, if the child was receiving MDCP and then was suddenly told that they're no longer eligible, We've seen a lot of issues with this, particularly since the transition of um, MDCP into Star Kids Managed Care. And that's something that you should reach out to Disability Rights Texas um, on. Uh, sometimes they have been successful in appeals or even arguing that just because the person, the, the child needs change doesn't mean that that's shows they no longer need the waiver, it may mean that the waiver was doing exactly what it's supposed to do and improving the child's needs. And when you take that waiver away, then does the child regress? 
So um, if you were receiving services and then told you no longer qualify, I would reach out to Disability Rights and see. That's, that's a really good point because we do hear from um, from families that have lost it or got kicked off or moved to another one or things like that. Um, uh, we had a question in the chat box. Um, can you explain the difference? Because we throw around HCS and Texas Home Living all the time. What are the differences between those two waivers? Is one better than the other? Great question. Um, HCS, I, I'm not going to say one is better or worse than the other because it depends on the individual's needs. A lot of people prefer HCS over Texas Home Living for two reasons. One, HCS provides the residential options such as a host home or group home. So even if you are living successfully with your family right now, but you don't always want to, or what happens if mom and dad pass away, there's the residential options like a group home or host home. Texas Home Living does not have those options. In addition, Texas Home Living has a lower cost cap. And this gets kind of in the weeds, but the cost cap for Texas Home Living is really low. It's 17,000, but with HCS, it's like 300 and something. So if you have higher support needs and are going to need more support than that 17,000 allows, Texas Home Living isn't gonna meet all of your needs. Again, there's some caveats with that because Community First Choice can supplement, um, but I don't wanna get too in the weeds on that. Yeah, thank you, thank otherwise, you for that. Otherwise, they're very similar. That those are the two main differences that and the eligibility criteria. Um, we're coming around the bend from a time perspective, so I want to run through these rest, uh, the rest and answer any questions. But I want to um, hit the hit of, on a point of you know how they get on the waivers if they're uh, how they get on the list if they're not already, and yeah. how um, and how the class waiver you think you're on the list of everything and how class is a different phone number so i hear people all the time say oh yeah i'm on all the lists but they're not on class the class list so anyway i want to make sure we touch on that before we go um today perfect why don't we do this in the interest of time like i told you guys there was no way especially with great questions i could cover all this so you'll have all the, the information if you want to go ahead and go to slide um Let's go to slide 28. And, then, and if you see something on here that you have questions about, reach back out. Um, a session is ending. I, I could also do presentations on just medic, uh, just managed care, just CDS. Um, is, this, is this the slide so that you were wanting? Go back one. Got it. Perfect. So in Texas, we have two ways that we fund um, these Medicaid waivers and services for people. Um, two different um, ways you can receive them. We have the first come, first serve interest list or wait list that you guys are probably very familiar with, or why you're probably here today. And then we have something called promoting independence, which is for people who want to get out of an institution and live in the community or transition. And then diversion or divert people, prevent people from entering an institution. Two separate pots of money to provide the same service, but to different populations. Yep, other way. So, how do you get on the list for that first come, first serve wait list? As Allison mentioned, we don't make it easy. To get on the MDCP class and DBMD wait list, you call the number you see up there. To get on the HCS Texas Home Living wait list or access CFC if you're eligible, you need to contact your local intellectual and developmental disability or LIDA, authority or LIDA. And everybody has a different, well not everybody, but there's, um, LIDAs are by region, I think there's 39. And you can find your local authority at the link there. I do not care what people tell you. If you call and they and you say, I want to get on all the lists, and they say you're on all the lists, you, you're not. If you do not take both stats, you are not on all the lists. No matter what they tell you, they're confused if they tell you that. So get on both. 
And also, um, so like Harris County is uh, is the Harris Center. It used to be MH um, MRA. Um, uh, Fort Bend County is going to be Texana. So some of uh, you know, I know people in the audience are from that area. I mean, they're they're all they're all different ones. But those are um, two of the big ones that we work with on a, on a on a regular basis. I think the other thing is is if you move or you change your phone number, your email address, you need to update your information with them. If they can't find you and they send you that letter every two years to say, do you still want to be on the list? Which, never mind that that letter is crazy. Of course, if I didn't remove myself from the list, I still want to be on the list. But anyway, they send this you know letter out every two years. Do you still want to be on the list? And you need to respond. And if you haven't updated your contact information, guess what? Uh, you could be going to the bottom of the list. Your 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 um, loved one could be actually removed from that list is, is what we're told. So, so it is important to at least update that from time to time. Do you agree with that, Ginger? It is important to update it um, to prevent things like that from happening. Um, and I mean, also just common sense if they can't call you and say your name came up, then how are you going to access the service? They don't actually remove people and throw you to the bottom of the list. Um, they can put you on an inactive status, but if you turn back up and show up, they will put you back in the same spot on the wait list as you were. So if if your name gets lost and you disappear, but you know you were on it, again, contact Disability Rights Texas because occasionally there are mistakes and they can help address those. Um, the we last just thing I want to mention, though, is the promoting independence waivers or crisis diversion. If you yes. or your loved one are in a situation where you feel like if you do not get a Medicaid waiver, you will end up in an institutional setting, then you need to call your local IDD authority and tell them you want to request an HCS crisis diversion waiver. Um, and in that case, you would be able to access a waiver without the, the continued wait. That is for people, again, who are in the situation where without those services may have to enter an institution. Um, but we never want someone to enter an institution who doesn't want to solely because of our wait list. We do have two mechanisms to provide services. I'm so glad you talked about that crisis diversion. That was what I was going to say. We had a minute left, and I wanted you to hit on that. Um, and these are like, um, you know, it, it truly, truly a crisis. This isn't... I'm irritated that the waiting list is 14 years and I'm gonna cry crisis. This is a true crisis. We've seen some where like maybe um, there is an aging individual, maybe a grandparent um, taking care of a, um, a grand, you know, a grandchild and the grandparents were, and then one grandparent died, the other grandparent was working. The, the needs of the individual were great and more than the aging grandfather, you know, could handle that, you know, that's an example. Um, he needed to work to be able to provide for the, <laughs> to provide for the grandson. So there's like all these moving parts that, you know, the, the, the person's, you know, someone has died, someone has a major illness, someone um, has the, you know, is, is clearly incapable of, of caring for that individual any longer. Sometimes the situation is dire because of mental illness or schizophrenia, um, uh, the individual being a threat to themselves or others and things like that. So I, I just want everybody to know that those are out there if um, that is a situation that you find yourself in. So um, Ginger, as usual, you did an awesome job. We are going to send out your slides because I know we didn't get through all of them, um, but you did an awesome job um, going yeah, through those. Have a fantastic we'll question. So we're going to send out the slides today. We don't normally do that. We'll send out the slides. We're going to send out the um, the 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 piece that you had mentioned, kind of that chart. Um, I believe we already have that, and we'll also um, send out the recording. So um, thanks everyone. Thanks everyone for being here today. Um, the very last question um, that we did have, and if this is early on and we didn't answer it, if you get Medicaid and you move states, does your Medicaid transfer with you, or do you have to reapply in the new state that you go to? Fantastic question. It does not transfer. You do have to reapply, and the uh, eligibility criteria may be different in different states. Frequently is, which is a good thing to remember when talking about 
well, this state does a better job than this state or Texas or whatever. It's never apples to apples. So just because one state seems to not have a wait list, that doesn't mean that they necessarily are providing more services. They may, they might make it harder to access services. They may have fewer waivers or I, 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 everything is different. There's no state that is perfect or the same. It would be a lot easier for individuals with disabilities and the families that love them if there was some continuity between the states, but there really isn't. So um, but there, yeah, there that is, is a great federal question. federal legislation in the works to try and do that, but who you knows? It's, the easiest thing is it's different for, to understand is it's, opposite, it's not the same as Medicare. Medicare, you take with you state to state. Medicaid does not. For sure, for sure. Well, here's our contact information, everyone. Uh, thanks again for joining us, and we'll get that email out to you. Thanks so much, Ginger, um, for all Thank of your you insight, Allison. and we'll look forward to having you back. Sounds good. Take care. Have a good afternoon.